Well, good morning. Welcome here. Let's stand together, please. Let's sing. Let's give our praise to God this morning, for He is good. Amen. Amen. Yours will be the only name that matters to me. The only one is faith. Good to have you here this morning. Let's be seated now and uh, watch what's coming up.
How do you follow that? Wow. That was the most amazing Easter service last week, wasn't it? And to see the, yeah. And I hope that you have been praying for the three young ladies that were baptized last week. Keep them in your prayers. It's just an awesome, awesome time. My name is Wayne, and I'm on the pastoral staff here, and I welcome you all to Chilliwack Alliance Church. Nice to have you on board, and we're going to have another exciting Sunday, aren't we? Awesome. Right, Pastor Greg. In the pew in front of you, if you are just visiting with us, please take a moment and fill out the connection card. That connection card is something that comes across my desk later in the week, and I will personally contact you. I'll call you. I'll touch base with you. Email you if I have to. Whatever you like, whatever your preference is, you indicate it on the card so that I can talk to you a little bit more about our church and how to become part of our family or answer some of your questions about the Alliance and the Alliance movement in Canada and what are we all about. So feel free to, even if you're just visiting from, you know, Alberta or Saskatchewan, I know you'd love to move here permanently and we'd love to have you here, but uh, fill in your card and let us know about your, your time with us. I'd also like to announce, in your bulletin, there are several inserts. They work really, really hard in the front office to prepare these inserts, to make them very attractive and make them enticing for you to read. And, and next week, next Sunday, the 30th, is a very, very busy day, but a great evening service. Oasis is inviting Steve Herzig, uh, a North American director for Friends of Israel, to come and talk about Israel, my glory and talk about Israel in the prophecy and in the end times. That should prove to be a very worthwhile service to come out to next Sunday evening at 6.30. Also, we are having on May the 7th a newcomer's luncheon. And uh, for if those of you who have been coming to our church for a year or just over a year and would like to get connected into care groups or into some of our Sunday school classes or just, you know, find out a little bit more what we're doing here at Chilliwack Alliance Church. There's a newcomers class presently underway. It's at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings. You can come to that if you wish. But on May the 7th, we're having a newcomers luncheon so we can all get together. Now, in, in light of that, we're going, last year, I expected 35 to 40 people. There were over 70 people that showed up. And we were able to stretch the chili and make it work. But this year, in preparation for 70 people, I'm going to ask for some volunteers. Ladies, if you wouldn't mind, if you could put together a, a pot of chili that would feed 8 to 10 people, that would be awesome. And if you could call me at the office and let me know that you're willing to do that. And then be prepared to bring it on the morning of the 7th. And we can set it all up in the uh, video cafe in the gymnasium for, uh, for around 1130 to start our our newcomers luncheon, okay? That would be really appreciated. Thank you. Also, Pastor Joe is taking the youth, a youth trip down to Mexico. A great bunch of kids are going down to visit with Rob and Brenda Wall at One Life, One Chance, and they're going to build an, another um, home or, or another residence down there. And in, in order to fund or pay for that trip, they're going to have a fundraiser next uh, on the 29th, Saturday, April the 29th, between 8 and 12, right here in the parking lot. There's going to be a car wash. There's going to be a pancake breakfast, a silent auction. So do look at these flyers that are in your bulletins and make note of that and plan to attend. Finally, one more exciting announcement. May the 1st, Monday night, 7 o'clock, take out your iPhones and day timers, put it in there. The Quebec travel log. Pastor Matt, Holly, and I went to Ramouski for the grand opening of La Maison de Ma Père, our father's house. What an amazing ministry. What you, you have to see what's going on in Ramouski. You have to see what the Lord is doing in Quebec. And we're holding a travel log Monday, May 1st, 7 o'clock, right here in the Coffee Connection Room. We'll have coffee and desserts available for you. And we'll even introduce our new team that's leaving at the end of May. So do plan to attend those events, will you? Awesome. Are you excited about being here this morning? Show me. Tell me. Yes, thank you. Now stand up and greet one another and praise the Lord, shall we? Thank you.
continue to worship together. No one higher. Our Father, Creator, you mold our hearts together. There's no one higher than you. Redeemer, Defender, our great and mighty. Father, where we're weak and where we look to ourselves and we lift ourselves up far too often, we pray you'd forgive. Thank you for your forgiveness, your grace in our lives. Help us to live with an eternal perspective in mind, one that desires to serve you in all that we do. So God, guide us this morning. Help us to praise you for you alone are worthy. Amen. Amen. Ah uh-huh. 
shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine. Will be I like to say so much of what we do, but instead I'll say everything that we do as a Christian is our lives are lived in response to what Christ has already done for us. And so we come on a Sunday morning and we worship because of what he has done for us. We come and we worship in response to who he is. We come and we give because of what he has done for us. It's an expression of our worship, of our submission, of our love and our trust in him. I know that there are people in this church who have been set free from horrible bondage, but by the blood of Christ. Isn't that right? You know, you've been set free from issues in your family. You've been set free from issues at work. You've been set free from, you know, issues that you've, maybe you've poured into your own life, uh, substance abuse, alcohol abuse, all sorts of different things. And Jesus sets us free. And as a result of that, we pray to him. Ushers, would you join me at the front, please? We're going to continue our worship through the giving of our tithes and our offerings, again, as an expression of our love to God. So would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we love you for who you are. We worship for you for who you are, and we love the fact that who you are has been expressed and is continually expressed in what you do. Your long-suffering, your blessings, how you walk with us, how you correct us, how you comfort us, how you surround us with good people. Father, for all these things, we praise you. How you provide for us, Lord, in all the different ways that we need it. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much. We praise you. We submit to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you go ahead? And as I take up the offering, I just want to let you guys know, kids, it is time for an after children's church, so you can do that now.
Well, good morning. It is a good day today. I'm excited to be here. Most because I get to baptize somebody, and that is seriously one of the best parts of my job. Um, my name's Holly. I'm a pastor here. Um, but today we get to celebrate and share a, an exciting moment in the life of one of our people. People have been doing this for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, it's a celebration um, of the life of Christ, and it's an identification of, of, of somebody's life with him. Again, people have been doing this for hundreds and hundreds of years. We do this because we're Christians, not to become a Christian, but it's a, it's a celebration. Being baptized is a celebration and identification of, of identi identifying with Christ in his death and his resurrection. And so I want to introduce um, some people in the tank here with me. Laura, Laura Hegeman. This is Laura. She's getting baptized today, and her brother, uh, her brother Kevin is going to be helping us out. So Laura, why don't you come and share your story with us? Um, I was born 18 years ago into a Christian home with three brothers and two amazing parents. I grew up going to church every Sunday with my family. I accepted Christ into my life at the age of four and many more times since then, you know, just to be sure God heard me. Of course, I, know, I now know he heard me the first time. I went to a Christian school my whole life and had Christian friends and family surrounding me all the time, so everything made it easy and safe to live a life where I could call myself a Christian. I have always learned and understood the basics behind Christianity, and I knew what it meant for someone to be a Christian. However, the older I got, the more I began to realize that the only aspect of my Christian life was riding on the coattails of my parents' faith. I took up their opinions and beliefs as my own and went to church every Sunday, but only because I had to. In my heart, I wanted Christ, but in my actions and the way I lived my day-to-day -day life, I clearly didn't. I recently joined a Bible study where we were going through an intense devotion called Behold Your God. This study really opened my eyes to the way God wants me to live my life and not the way I think is best. It goes through how we need to learn who God says he is and not who we want him to be. It then goes through how we need to respond to our new knowledge of God and put him above everything because he's the focus of it all. I realized that I significantly needed to change the way I go about my faith. I needed to recommit my life to God in a way that pleases him and not me. I needed to remember to leave everything up to God because he knows best, and whatever plans he has for me are better than my own. I do not want to focus on loving God because of what he has done for me, but rather because of who he is. I have thought about baptism for a few years now, but I was never sure that I would be doing it for the right reason. I wanted to please my family, but I knew that this was a poor reason, so I held off on this decision until now. I now know that I want God to be the focus of my life, and I have made my faith, not my parents, but my own. So today I want to get baptized, not only because God tells us to be baptized as believers, but to make a public declaration that I have chosen to commit myself to God and let him be the focus of my life. This is an exciting day for all of your family. What I told your brothers at their baptisms applies to you as well. <clears throat> this opportunity to encourage you in the ordinance of baptism is an opportunity I consider to be a very special privilege. Your decision to be baptized is a very important one. It's a public confession of your faith to follow and put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Baptism illustrates your death to sin with a new life in Christ. Romans 6.4 puts it this way, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You have been raised with Christ, and his Holy Spirit lives within you today. Your decision to be baptized brings joy to, and happiness to all of your family and friends. We have all prayed for your salvation, and God has graciously answered our prayers. I know you cannot remember your Grandma Warren, as you were too young when she passed away. But while she was alive, she faithfully prayed daily for your salvation. 
and God has honored your grandma for her faithful prayers. Today, all of us in your family praise the Lord. Because of your decision to follow him in the steps of baptism, this testifies to your desire to grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's word gives us several examples of women who were humbled and contrite women of God. Mary was the mother of Jesus, a devout and godly woman. Scripture tells us that God highly favored her. Mary's humility was astonishing and is a great example for all believers. And Ruth is another example of a humble, contrite woman of God. Ruth told her mother-in-law, Naomi, wherever you go, I will go. And those words of Ruth so embody what being a follower of Christ should be. And Esther is another sterling example of faith, but also one of courage. She was queen to King Ahasuerus, and when her nation Israel was in jeopardy of being totally wiped out, Esther said, I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. A brave woman indeed. Then there is Mary Magdalene. She was faithful during Christ's time on earth, even at his trial, his crucifixion, and afterwards. So Laura, with these are, Laura, with these are examples of godly women of the Bible. It's my prayer that you will be a devout and godly young woman, like Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Ruth, the humble and contrite woman of God, a brave woman like Esther, who was willing to perish in order to save her nation, Israel, and Mary Magdalene, who was very attentive to loving and living for the Lord every day. And so I trust you too will follow Christ with sterling faith and courage. I am extremely uh, pleased to be able to give this opportunity, get this opportunity to uh, wish you all the best. And I know that the Lord will bless you and strengthen you as long as you remember to remember him and make your daily life one to live for him. Thank you. All right, Laura, do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and was buried and raised again? Yes. Are you ready to do this? Yes. All right. So based on your confession of faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, that just never gets old, does it? Seeing bap we have baptisms every week. Would anyone like to get baptized next week? Let's see your hands. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay. Uh, Pastor Leon is in Kelowna. He got his last child married off yesterday, and so he's probably just finished wiping his face of all the tears. I'm just going to speak loud. He'll be back next week, and that'll be wonderful. But I'm going to get into our time in the God's Word, so Cheryl, why not you pray? Uh, let's bow our heads and pray. Uh, Father, we rejoice with Laura. Uh, thank you for her step of obedience and her step of faith and uh, just her desire to align herself with you and to follow what you want for her life and to seek, um, to seek who you are, not just for what you do for us. And Lord, I pray the rest for the rest of us, that we wouldn't just focus on what you have done for us and what you will do for us. Lord, that we would come to your feet with desire to get to know you and with the desire to learn who you are and with that to trust you because you are good so in our time right now Lord I pray that we would do just that that we would sit at your feet and that we would listen to your words putting aside the um, the worries and struggles and pressures of our day-to-day -day lives and that we would come to you and just hear from you and get to know you. And I pray that you would speak through Matt and that your words would uh, really take root in our hearts. 
In your name, amen. Okay, well, we all, oftentimes in the church, we take up a collection. Um, sometimes people take up two collections in a service, but today, actually, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start our time of the word with a bit of a reverse collection, where rather than you putting something into the basket, you take something out of the basket. Aren't you glad you came to church today, friends? Don't, you're not going to get rich on this, but okay, ushers, would you please come? And they're just going to pass these baskets along, and there are little coins in there, and if you would just take one out, what I want you to do is to take it out and just hold it in your hand throughout the course of this message, um, and it'll all eventually make sense. Again, we should have this also in the video cafe. Uh, there are three baskets at the back. If you just want to pass those around, that'd be great. Everyone could take one. When I told Pastor Greg what I was going to do today, he said, what, you're paying people to listen to you now? <laughs> you know, Maybe. And if Pastor Leon says, so how was Sunday? You can say, it was a very enriching experience, okay? You do that for me. All right, well, as that gets passed out, um, I just want to tell you a true story about a small town church in small town Ontario that I heard probably 25 years ago from my pastor growing up. And when I heard it, I thought, is that for real? So about five years after I heard it, I went back to Pastor Austin. I said, you remember that story that went, you know, this and that and the other thing? He said, yeah. I said, was that, was that true? He said, of course it's true. It happened in this, this part of, of southern Ontario. I said, I can't believe it. So believe it or not, this is a true story, but the story goes that about 100 years ago, everyone in this certain small town, small town church, you know, and they all went there, it was four cars, so they got in their horse and buggy, and winter and summer was always the same. They would go into this one small town church, and they would have a time of, of worship and word and fellowship, and everyone was happy because everyone thought the same. But then a few years go by, and good old Henry Ford, he came with his Model T, which brought the price of cars down a little bit so that more and more people could afford it. Now in this small town, to the small town church, he had people who would drive to the church in their horse and buggy, winter and summer, it was always the same, didn't matter. But they'd be joined by people in their black Model T Fords. Because remember, Henry Ford said you could have any color you want as long as it's black. And so they were all there in this church, and eventually, with people with their horse and buggies in their cars, they get into this fight because they said, how is it that you as a good Christian can come, can, can own a car? Don't you know that cars are worldly and evil? People thought, what do you, show me in the Bible where it says you can't drive a car. Show me in the Bible where it says that machines are bad. But, you know, they fought back and forth and, and tempers flared and, and the argument got escalated and eventually this church bang, that split with the people with the wagons keeping the building and the people with the cars getting shipped out. And what they did is that they drove to the very next lot, they bought that plot of land, they built their own church, and they started to worship there. So now, in this small town Ontario, you had people who would drive to church and their horse and buggy, winter and summer, didn't matter, it was always the same. And they'd get passed by their people in the, in the black Model T Fords, beep, beep, and they would go to that second church. They worship side by side. They'd have a time of worship, word and fellowship, and everyone was happy. Because everyone thought the same. Until you could get cars with color. Oh, you didn't just have to have a black Model T. Now you could have green cars and blue cars and red cars. Now you could have cars with chrome on it. And people in church number two started to say, how is it that you can call yourself a Christian and you can drive a car with color? Doesn't the very thing say sin to you? Chrome, what do you mean? And people say, what's wrong with chrome? Do you have a mirror in your house? It's like the same thing. You don't want me to have chrome, get rid of all your mirrors. And, and things escalated, tempers flared, they had a big fight, and boom, church number two split, and what happened? The Model T people, the black people, they stayed there, and the people with colored chromy cars, they went right next door, they bought the plot of land right next to church number two, which was right next to church number one. They built a third church right there, so that now, every Sunday morning, in this small town Ontario, you had people driving in the horse and buggy to the first church, winter and summer, it didn't matter, it was always the same. They got passed by the people in their black boards, and they went to that second church who got passed by the people in their blue, red, and, and, and green cars with chrome on it, and they went to that third church where they all ended up having times of worship and word and fellowship, and everyone was happy because everyone thought the same. Silly, isn't it? It's silly. But we have debated these sorts 
of gray areas, we'll call them, that the Bible doesn't specifically address for centuries in the church. And for centuries, churches have split over all of them. And so, should you raise your hands in worship or not? Should you have instruments or not? Should you sing harmonies or not? Should Christians, should Christians gamble? Should Christians drink alcohol? Should they go to movies? Should Christians, should we have kitchens in churches? Should you have churches that only speak German or should you have churches that speak English as well? Friends, we have fought over these kind of issues for centuries. And while some of these are kind of laughable causes of debate today, when they came up, we need to recognize that these were real issues that had well-meaning Christians on both sides of this debate who wanted to do what was right. They wanted to honor God with their behavior and with their thoughts and their actions, but they couldn't agree on how to do that. And so, when that happens, you know, when you come into conflict in the church, or I'd say when you come into conflict at home, on the sports field, at school, with your neighbor, with your kids, with your spouse, with your parents, whenever you come into conflict in general, I'd say, what's the underlying principle that you're going to make your decisions on? What's going to drive your actions? Is it going to be culture? Theology? Maybe the latest trendy book? Tradition? I personally think that it would be easy for me to kind of act according to any one of those principles. And depending on my mood, honestly, I could fall one way or the other. But really, is your mood a good basis upon which to make a decision? You know, when you're wronged or when you come into conflict, should you react based on the current state of your digestion? You could. But I don't really think that it's a good thing to do. In fact, I think the Bible shows us a better way in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And again, if you've got your Bibles, would you please take them out and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Where we see that through the Apostle Paul, God challenges us to ask basically two questions. The first one is, in this conflict, how can I live for God? Kind of the flip side of that coin is, is am I living for myself or am I living for God? So the first question that we ask in conflict is, how can I live for God in this? And the second question that we see Paul illustrating throughout the course of 1 Corinthians is, is summed up in this question. What can I do so that the kingdom of God grows in you? So how can I live for God? And what can I do so the kingdom of God grows in you? If you don't have a Bible, we do supply Bibles for you in the pew rack in front of you. In the main house, it's on page 852. In the video cafe, you will find it on page 115. Four, eight. Now, let's get to the Bible. Here, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 says this. Now about food sacrificed to idols. We know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. But the man who loves God is known by God. Now again, remember, if you see a word that's repeated many times in a, in a short passage, that word is significant for you. And this word knowledge is huge in this passage. But before we get to that, what I want you to recognize is that what God is saying to us through this passage that in the church, and I would argue in all of our interactions with anyone, knowledge should not be the primary basis for our decisions or our actions. Instead, self-sacrificial love needs to be our primary motivation for all that we do. If for no other reason, because love is something that is characteristic of God. And since it's characteristic of God, it should also be characteristic, in my opinion, of us as his believers. Think about it. The Bible says that God is love. In, in John chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says this. It says, for God so what? Yes. Because God loved the world, he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. What motivated God? It was his love. How about Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 5? Here we see the Bible say this. But because of his great video cafe, because of his great what? I'm going to take that on faith, okay? Because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. And then 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. Here the Bible says this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live 
Friends, love is one of God's highest motivations. It's something that defines him. It's something that characterizes him. And so it should also ought to characterize us and our actions as well. Theologians talk about how love is the characteristic that binds the Trinity together. Myself, I kind of wonder, did God create as an expression of his love? Because you think about it, you know, love kind of creates things. Love invites people into a relationship. Either way, the Bible shows us that love, that which gives of itself for the benefit of the other, is one of God's primary driving forces. And as such, it should be one of ours as well. But what we see in this passage is that for the Corinthians, love wasn't what drove their actions. It wasn't love. Instead, it was knowledge that was the basis for their actions. It was their dominant motivator. And now, while there's nothing wrong with knowledge, you know, the Bible says that, that knowledge is one of the gifts of the Spirit. You know, knowledge is a good thing. Truth is a good thing. And while that's certainly true, what we see in our passage and also in our daily lives in general is that when people try to kind of force their knowledge on you, oftentimes it doesn't go well. A number of months ago, I took a class in theology at the seminary, the Alliance Seminary in Calgary. And the first thing that our professor had us read wasn't, wasn't even the Bible. It wasn't text from these great theologians from the past or the present, whatever. The first thing he had us read was a number of chapters from a book that a professor wrote to his students basically saying, saying this. He said, listen, as you learn things, as you grow in knowledge, don't be dumb about it. Don't argue. Don't fight. Recognize that you might be wrong, because what he had seen is that as his students grew in their knowledge of theology, and as they grew to kind of uh, firm up their understanding of the Bible and God, they ended up fighting with each other all the time. So, no, no, you need to be Arminian. No, you need to be Calvinist. No, you need to understand this. And the Bible says this, and that says this, and that implies this. And they fought, and they fought, and they fought. One of our own young people, who just went to Ambrose this past year, she said that there's a number of people in her classes who did this all the time, truly drew, drove one of her teachers to tears. Where this man stopped his class right in midstream, he says, everyone get out your Bibles right now. I want you to read this passage in the Gospels. And with tears in his eyes, he says, I am not helping you. I'm not trying to make you into better Pharisees. I'm trying to make you into better followers of Jesus Christ. Folks, as we grow in knowledge, like the Bible says, so often we get puffed up and we think that we are self-important. You should listen to me. You should do what I say because I know everything. That's what was happening in the Corinthian church. That's what was happening in our seminary. And it happens day in and day out as well. Think about it. If you're having a bad day with your kids... And they're just having a horrible day. They're crying, screaming, fighting, hitting each other. And you get some blessed person come on over and they say, you know what the Bible says about how you should raise your children? Blah, 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 blah. Do you, who here wants to rise up and call them blessed? <laughs> Nobody. We just want you to rise up and pick up my kid. Please help. You know, truth is good, friends. Truth is essential. But it can be tempting to use truth and our knowledge as a club on other people. Knowledge is good because knowledge can free our minds and open our eyes to more of the good things that God has for us. Knowledge is good. But as Gordon Fee says, knowledge cannot serve as a primary basis for our behavior in the church. He says in Christian ethics, knowledge, what we know, must always lead to love. And so right off the bat, here in our passage, through Paul, God lays down love for your brother and sister as the primary motivation for all that we do and also the primary motivation for this conflict in Corinth. But what was the conflict that they were actually facing? Well, verse 4 tells us, So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, there's the conflict in a nutshell. Now we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that's true. And that there's no God but one. That's also true. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many so-called gods and many lords, yet for us there is only but one God, the Father, for, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But look at verse 7. 
But not everybody knows this. Now this next picture. This is a picture of the ruins of first century Corinth. Um, this is Corinth, I guess, you know, it was in better shape then, but this is Corinth from when Jesus and Paul uh, both walked the earth. It doesn't look like much now, but what we know is that in the first century, Corinth was a very wealthy place, and it was also very cosmopolitan. Because it made so much money, it was so, I guess, so easy to make a buck, you had people from all over the world who had come to Corinth to kind of find their fortunes. And as a result of that, it had temples and altars and shrines all over the place. You see, the ancient peoples, they were very, very religious. And they believed that there wasn't one God. They believed that there were many gods. There were the gods over, you know, this lake and over, over the sea and over the mountains and the skies and over this region and over that region. And they all kind of grew up just believing this. And so while they may have lived, you know, over here and they had their regional God and that was good. And you're over in Ephesus and you had, you know, your regional God and that was good. When we both came to Corinth, we would bring our regional gods with us because we would keep worshiping them because we thought that they were good. But then we'd also start to worship the gods of Corinth. And so these people People grew up in this whole polytheistic world, a, a world and a belief in many, many gods. So you can imagine their surprise that when they became a Christian, they found out that the Bible says, no, 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 there's not many gods, it's just one God. You can imagine that it would have been kind of hard for them to accept the truth of that. Think about it. These people were brought up in one way of thinking. Everyone around them thought the same way. And now they find out about Jesus. And Jesus frees them, this is wonderful. And th but then they say, oh, what do you mean there's only one God? Really? How does all this work? It would be hard for them. You can imagine that they wouldn't necessarily have accepted it on the first try. I know a man named Daniel Shayesta. Uh, Daniel was raised in, uh, a Muslim. He became radicalized. He was a radical Muslim. He actually met his wife on a firing range. She was learning how to shoot an AK-47. He thought, hey, I like how you shoot that gun. And they ended up getting married, had kids, all this kind of stuff. But they were like radical Muslims. And then Daniel ended up getting gloriously transformed, became a Christian, loved the Lord. He's an evangelist. He's read the Bible, all this kind of stuff. And so I met him when he was on a tour going through New Zealand. And I said, Daniel, Daniel, what was it like? The first time you ate pork. Muslims, they don't eat pork. They think that pork is dirty, unclean. So Daniel, what was it like? The first he read the Bible, he knew that all things were clean. He said, I felt dirty from here all the way down to here. But he's a believer, he knew the truth. And yet it still took time for the truth to settle into the rest of his life. Maybe you've been told that you're worthless and ugly. Maybe you've been told that your whole life. You know what, friends? It might take some time for you to come to accept the fact that you are made in God's image and likeness. And because of that, you carry incredible innate worth and beauty. Maybe like my grandpa, you were told that you're a failure and you'll never amount to anything. You were told that you're useless and you have nothing to offer. You've been told that your whole life. It may take a while for you to realize that you have been gifted by God and that God has a plan for your life and he wants to do something beautiful both in you and through you in this church, in this community, around this world. And while that is true, my friends, it might take a while for you to accept that. Sometimes it takes time for the truth to set in. It's one thing to be told something, but it's quite another thing to accept it. And while these believers had been told that there is but one God, they found it difficult to, to separate their past experience and their past understanding with the biblical truth. I love how the message paraphrase puts it in this passage. Here the message says, an imagination and conscience shaped under those conditions isn't going to change overnight. So again, verse 7, but not everyone knows this. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a real idol. And since their conscience is weak, they see that food as being defiled. They see that food as being dirty. And if they see it as defiled and dirty, then you'd wonder, why would you ever eat meat 
or food that had been sacrificed to an idol. Would you want to know why? Money. You know the little coin you're holding in your hand? That's why they ate food that had been sacrificed to an idol. You see, while Corinth was very, very cosmopolitan, it was also very, very rich. With it being rich and cosmopolitan, it drew an awful lot of people from all around the world. And a lot of people who came to Corinth were kind of from the lowest rung of the socioeconomic ladder. They were called freed men and freed women. They were just kind of one step up from being a slave. But because they knew that you could go to Corinth and make money, and also because Corinth had no real established aristocracy, all the rich fancy people, they still lived in Rome. Because it had no real aristocracy, you could come from any background, you could come to Corinth, and you, there was no limit to how high you could ascend in society in Corinth. Beautiful. So it drew people from all over the place. But to climb that social ladder, friends, you had to know all the right people and you had to go to all the right parties. And guess where those happened? That all happened in the temples of pagan gods. And all those parties served meat that had been sacrificed to an idol. So friends, understand, there was a big incentive for these people to want to fit in with what was going on in Corinth. And since, of course, since an idol is actually nothing, then why not go ahead? After all, the earth is the Lord's and all that is therein. So why not go ahead and enjoy, give thanks and enjoy? After all, we know the truth and the truth has set us free. So why not do it? Theologically speaking, there's nothing wrong with it. Well, here's why. Verse 9 tells us. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom, so Paul agrees that they are free to do this. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to that idol? So the weak brother for whom Christ died and therefore is, is imbued with incredible worth, Therefore, this important person for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. So again, what was happening is that you had some of these people who were new to faith, seeing their other brothers and sisters, going to these pagan temples and eating in these different celebrations, rubbing shoulders with all those kind of people. And they said, what are you doing? No, 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 you shouldn't do that. I just came out of that. It's bad. Don't go there. Don't go there. But these other people said, listen, there's, I'm not actually doing anything wrong. This is okay. I'm free to do this. And so we're at an impasse. On the one hand, you've got people who want to eat meat and drink wine and rub shoulders while they climb a social ladder, which again, theologically was acceptable. And on the other hand, you have those who only wanted to eat meat and moldy bread, or only wanted to not eat meat. They wanted to eat moldy bread and drink weak tea to go along with their weak and young theology. Because for them, to do anything else was like abandoning Jesus Christ. So what we see is that in the church of Corinth, not everybody was happy because not everybody thought the same. So what do you do? Do you always kind of settle at the lowest common denominator? Do you kind of drag people along to these, these, these parties to, kinda, to show them that it was okay? But risk shipwrecking their faith? Now what do you do? It's tricky. In some ways it's kind of like the question of whether Christians should drive, you know, colorful cars or not. By the way, judging by our parking lot, it seems as though you have all, you know, settled that question in your minds. But it's similar to that question. Should a Christian drive a colorful car or not? Or should a Christian participate in yoga or martial arts? Are these things okay? Is it good for us to gamble? Is it okay for us to drink or to take out mortgages? Because I've heard people say, you know what? The Bible says that you should be mastered by nothing. And when you get a big mortgage, it becomes your master. So should a Christian have a mortgage? Or... Should believers um, sing in parts at church? I've had people come to me and say there should be no music in church. And in that, they're not saying that you should sing like hymns or choruses or drums or guitar. No, they're not saying that. They're saying you should have no music at church and everyone should only sing the melody. Because the body of Christ is one body, Ephesians chapter 4. We are one body and when you start to sing parts, you are dividing the body. I've had this conversation, friends. Incidentally, if you sit over here, you know that Pastor Leon always sings the harmony. He never keeps time with everybody else. And I thought, if he tried to sing the, 
Melody, only his head would explode, you know, so we're just going to let him do that. But for some people, these are genuine concerns. So what do you do when not everyone thinks the same? What's the underlying principle that you're going to make decisions by? When you come into conflict, be that with someone here or someone in your own community, your own family, your own neighborhood, your school, whatever, what underlying principle will you operate by? We've already seen that love for your brothers and sisters needs to motivate us to ask, to act, pardon me, but how does that love manifest itself? What does it look like to love God and one another when you disagree? Well, again, I think it looks like asking ourselves those two questions. The first one is, Lord, Father, how can I live for you in this? And I didn't make this up. This came from verse 6 of chapter 8. Where Paul said, there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came, and listen, for whom we live. And so when you're in a conflict, you need to say, Lord, how can I live for you in this conflict? Because so often when we come into a conflict, we think, no, 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 I want to live for me. I want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to my priorities and my thoughts and what I think is important. I want you to bow to my culture. I just want you to live for me there. And so when we come into a conflict, we don't say, how can you live for me? You say, Lord, how can I live for you in the midst of this conflict? And the second question that we need to ask is simply this. What can I do so the kingdom of God grows in you? What can I do so the kingdom of God grows in you and in you and in you? And in you. Our friends, what we see throughout the whole core, like half of the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul models this for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he talks about whether or not people should get married. And he basically says, you know what? Do whatever it is that helps you to honor Jesus the most. In, ver- in, in chapter 8, he's talking about food sacrifice to idols. He says, you know what? It's okay, but don't, don't crush the work of the kingdom in someone's life because of your freedom. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he illustrates this principle where he says, listen, I didn't receive any money from you from the, the church in Corinth because I didn't want to hinder, though I was allowed to, I didn't want to hinder God's work in your life. So I let other churches fund me. You go on to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. They're talking about tongues. You know what Paul says in that chapter? He says, I am so glad that I have spoken in tongues more than all of you. But listen, I would rather speak five intelligent words to someone, intelligible words to someone in prophecy so that the the kingdom could grow in them than a thousand words of tongues. What's he saying? He's saying that his underlying philosophy in life is this. What can I do so the kingdom of God grows in you? His highest priority was not himself. How can I live for God? And how can I live so that his kingdom flourishes in this world? In that, you know what, people? He was living exactly like Jesus. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be clung to for his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing. Taking the very form of a servant, he became obedient to death, even death on the cross. That's Philippians chapter 2. And what that means is that Jesus sacrificed his comforts and his rights as king of kings and lord of lords to come to see the kingdom come on earth in your life and in mine. So when you come into conflict with whomever it may be, as Christians, we need to live like Jesus, like the Christ, and say, God, how can I live for you in this? And what can I do so the kingdom of God grows in you? But that's hard. Because I want my kingdom to grow. I want you to do what I want to do. That's what God had called us to. doesn't matter if you're knowledgeable or new in the faith. This is what we've been called to do, but it's a hard life to live. And we will never live that kind of Christ life while we're still holding on to the things that are so important to us. While we're holding on to these things that we value so highly because I can't live for God when I'm holding on to this. I don't care if it's your kids or your car or your dreams for retirement. When we hold on to certain things in life with a clenched fist, all we do is sow seeds for ineffective and divided life and ministry. 
So what's the thing in your life that's stopping you from living for Jesus? What's the thing in your life that's stopping you from saying, Lord, how can I live for you in this? What don't you want to submit to him? Because as you have something that you hold on to, it's going to cause conflict. Is it your sexuality? Is it your holiday time? Is it maybe your financial security? It's going to be different for each and every one of us. Is it your job, your marital status, your hobbies, your comfort? Is it your culture? What don't you want to give to Jesus? What's preventing you from living for him and, seeing his, and pursuing his kingdom in our Chilliwack? In 1981, our church, Chilliwack Alliance, was on the brink of financial ruin. You, you know, if you lived at that time, you know what it was like. Interest rates were terrible. Our church here had a huge mortgage at a bad interest rate. Every week, week after week, I'm told, it was just, are we going to make it by? Are we going to make it to another week? Well, in the midst of this massive trial, crisis that we were going through as a church, I don't even know who they were, so I'm, I totally feel free to do this. There was a number of families in our church who got together, and even though they were mortgage-free, they took out mortgages on their homes. In 1981, what was the interest rate, like 89%? They took out mortgages on their homes in 1981. And gave that money to the church so that this church would keep their doors open. What did they do? They took that which is important to most of us in the West, being our financial security and our financial freedom, and they went like this to Jesus. They said, Lord, what can I do so that the kingdom can grow? Mortgage my house, I'll do that for you. Lord, how can I live for you in the midst of this crisis? Everything that I am and everything that I have is yours. Take it. Use it. What do you want me to do? Now, at the start of our time together, I gave you a coin. Some of you took a nickel. Some of you took a dime. Some of you took a quarter. Whatever it was. But I want you to take that coin, and I want you to put it in your hand. And I want you to close your fist on it. And I want you to ask yourself... What is it in my life that is stopping me from living a Christ-like life? What is it in my life that is stopping me from saying, Lord, how can I live for you in this? What don't you want to give to him? What is it in your life that's stopping you from saying, Lord, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth in this life as it is in heaven? Can you think of something? What don't you want to give over to God? What is that important to you? And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I'm not going to ask for anything obvious. But this morning, I simply want to ask you, if you're willing, you open your hand to Jesus and say, Jesus, this thing is yours. I give it to you. You might need a lot of help to do it. You might need to say, Jesus, I need your help to pry my fingers open on this to give this to you. Do that. Because that honors Christ. Again, this passage says that we live through Christ. Let's not try to do this on our own strength. Let's say, Jesus, I recognize that this is an idol in my life, and I want to give it to you. So that in good times and in bad, in conflict and in times of peace, I can say, Lord, how can I live for you in this? What can I, Lord, how can I see your kingdom come in Chilliwack as it is in heaven? Those people who mortgage their homes... Like I said, they said, Lord, how can I live for you in this crisis? What can I do so the kingdom of God grows in all of us? And a lot of good came because of how they submitted themselves to Jesus and, er and how they gave everything over to him. My challenge for you is to do the same. My challenge for you is to live through Jesus and say, Jesus, give me the strength to give this to you. Give me the strength to live for you in both good times and in bad. So that I don't see the conflict as primary. I see your people as primary. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Oh, Father, this is so hard. And I know that we cannot do this on our own. 
because it's so easy to close our fist again upon these things. And so, Jesus, I pray that you would not only give us light into what it is that you're calling us to hand over to you, but I pray that you would also give us the strength to hand that over and to just give it to you and take our hands off it. Father, we want to live lives that honor you. We want to see as a church your kingdom come in this place and all around the world. But I suppose it needs to start in our own lives. And so I pray that you would work in our hearts and lives today. So that you will be first in our life. So we will develop really good habits so that I guess we can keep our hands open and off of things. So that when we come into conflict with people, what, what will matter isn't so much the thing, but rather the person. What, what will matter isn't so much the issue, but rather your kingdom. Lord, help us to live in love. Help us to glorify you in our thoughts and our actions, our attitudes, our priorities. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds with truth and knowledge. I pray that you would fill our hearts with love. And that that would be, I guess, your spirit would drive us and lead us in all of these things. So, Lord, I just ask for you to work in all of our hearts, in mine and the lives of those friends here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together. And in response to the word preached today, let's sing a song of surrender together. Jesus, all for Jesus.
with you again today, friends. You know, we're going to have some people up at the front to pray with you if you want to, if you want to do that, if the Lord has spoken to you, if you need some burden taken off your chest, we'd love to pray with you. If you want to talk through things, we'd love for you to come up and chat through different things. But nothing else I want to say. God loves you. You are precious in his sight and in ours. I'm glad you've come to join us together today to worship. God bless you. We'll see you next week.